Hey folks, it's me, Dr. Mike Ezratel for Renaissance Periodization, and today we are talking about hypertrophy myths, and this myth is active ROM, active range of motion. People talk about it all the time. We're going to talk about what it is, why it could be a good thing and could make some good points, why it's not so great and pretty bad and pretty mythical, and then real talk to wrap it all up at the end. So, the active ROM myth is from people saying something like the following. Don't go down that low on the leg press. Your quads aren't active anymore. It's just passive range of motion. Anything over this height of upright rows or lateral raises is all traps. It's not side delts anymore. Uh, the lats are not active you know, past the torso, nor are they active close to the top of the stretch. So don't go in either one. Just do the, this stuff right here and keep it to that range because that's the active range, right? And more generally, it's this idea that you can take muscles naturally through their natural uh, motions on the limbs through distinct ranges in which they are so inactive or in such precarious positions that it's not worth going to that range of motion. And I'll tell you right now, this myth does have some good points, plenty of good points, but not as many good points as most people think, which is why it's a myth. It's a marginal myth, like almost all myths, except for like, I don't know, the existence of ghosts and angels and shit. I don't know, maybe angels are real. Aren't angels all around us in a certain sense as people and often dogs? Do all dogs really go to heaven? That's, that's got to be like fucking bullshit, right? You're telling me Cujo went to fucking heaven after eating all those fucking kids? Bullshit. All right. <laughs> you get to heaven and Cujo's the first dog you see. He's like, oh my God, you're in hell. Here is the good point that active ROM advocates make. Now, they rarely make it this way because usually they don't make very good points, but some of them do, and here are the good points. If the target muscle for an exercise, let's say the pecs or the lats or whatever you're targeting through an exercise, a press or a pull, is no longer generating almost any force or a very tiny force relative to what it is capable of, and I mean internally generating, not externally, not you can lift a ton of weight here, but not a lot of weight here. I mean, internally, the muscle is barely contracting. If it is in an especially injurious position, one of which is like, yeah, you can get to that range of motion, but you'll fuck your shit up. Like a completely rounded lower back at the bottom of an ultra heavy squat or deficit deadlift. If the muscle is no longer the target of the stimulus. So for example, if you have a completely straight arm fly with your pecs, at some point your biceps are really doing all the work and getting all the stretch and your pecs aren't. So it's not really a pec fly anymore. It's a bicep fly, which is actually not a terribly ineffective thing for biceps, but not what we want. Or the muscle is no longer the limiting factor of the movement. So again, the flies are a great example. We're down super, super low. Your pecs are not the limiting factor. Your biceps are a limiting factor. And if they're not strong enough, the movement doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't even get high enough, enough for your pecs to catch enough leverage to start doing this. If that's the case, then putting the muscle in that position and training regularly is perhaps unwise. And you should constrict your ROM such that your training avoids the above. So if down here in flies, your shoulders hurt like shit, it's all biceps and dick else is happening, uh, maybe don't do that. Maybe bend your arms a little bit and go just this low, not super crazy deep, and maybe good things will happen. Absolutely true. Just talked about the pack flies in an example, so we're good there. All right, some good points. However, the bad stuff and where this goes a bit too far and turns into a myth. The muscle doesn't have to be its most active to get a great stimulus. The biceps show the best EMG activity in the middle range. But we know that stretch under load from direct experimentation grows muscles, probably most muscles, more. So no, the biceps are not as active as measured by EMG in a deep stretch position on an incline curl, for example, but they still get a great stimulus, arguably an even better stimulus down there than they get over here. So that active ROM is already something that passive tension generated by muscles in their ultrastructures do contribute to hypertrophy. And active versus passive is not dichotomous, it is a spectrum. Muscles are more or less active, more or less passive in their force generating and force handling. And a muscle that is producing less active force but more passive force can still be very, very hypertrophically stimulating. So, okay, it's not all or nothing thing. So if a muscle is less active at some point in the range of motion, that doesn't mean it's a bad range of motion. It could be equally or even more hypertrophic. Interestingly enough, passive 
uh, passive force generation and the hypertrophy that's mediated could actually require you less physical uh, emotional effort and thus could actually have lower nervous system fatigue. So you're getting hypertrophy without trying all that hard. Amazing. Next, and this is a huge one, muscles, many muscles, all the ones studied so far, as far as I know, seem to get their best hypertrophic yields at stretched positions. Stretch under load is a real hell of a combination to elicit muscle growth. We know from lots of research that for a few reasons, which I describe in another video about the limits of EMG testing, and that video is already published, you can Google it, you don't get EMG, which is muscle activation as measured by uh, uh, electrical activity with all the leads and all that stuff. You don't get very high EMG signals out of a stretch position for a variety of reasons, but you get even better hypertrophy from that position. So if we look at studies, for example, they've done at least one study where people are do pull doing pullovers, and at some 120 or some shit degrees and further this way, the EMG activity drops off. And people have interpreted that study to say that it's bad to go beyond that range of motion. It's beyond its active range. Bullshit, that's where it gets a ton of stretch and probably even the most growth for the lats occurs from here to here, or at least a very robust amount of growth. So that's a thing. And... Other muscles can become important in those extreme ranges of motion, but they're still not limiting. Like there is a, a way in which, for example, gee whiz, at the very bottom of your leg press, your glutes can become important contributors, but your quads, even though they're ultra stretched, are still the limiting factor. So even though other muscles start to show very high activities, that doesn't mean it becomes a glute exercise. It becomes more of a glute exercise than it was, but is even more and more of a quad exercise than it was because the quads are getting stretched like crazy and there's a lot of hypertrophy there. In addition to that, it's this just, just I don't understand how the fuck people come to this conclusion, but people seem to think that every exercise needs to map one-to-one -to, -one to a muscle. It turns out that it's okay for a single exercise to additionally hypertrophy other muscles that are not the single target muscle. So... You know, people will say in rows or something, don't pull the elbow behind the back because the lats lose leverage there. And that's true. But how is it that you are able to bring the elbow behind the back? It sure as hell isn't magic. Other muscles must do it. Muscles like the rhomboids, muscles like perhaps the teres major, muscles like the rear delts. And unless you are doing one exercise for your lats, another exercise for your rhomboids, another exercise for your middle traps, another exercise for your teres major, another exercise for teres minor, I can't forget that shit, another exercise for your adults, and so on, you have to have some, the two or three exercises you do for back in a given session cover a bunch of muscle groups. So if we're saying, well, don't reach past this because it uses other muscles and don't reach past this because it uses other muscles and it's not lats, we have to train all the other muscles too, and doing a full range of motion in most cases just fucking grows the shit out of your whole back and rear delts and everything. It's all good stuff. You don't have to piss away time doing 50 redundant exercises to hit all the muscle groups. You can do like a few sets of bent rows or machine rows, a few sets of an isolation exercise like one of these, and a few sets of pull-ups or pull-downs, and then your whole fucking back is toast. And rear delts too, as opposed to being ultra, ultra specific for no reason, right? So that's the bad stuff. Now, here's the real talk. The ultimate guide to what range of motion you should be using is the stimulus to fatigue ratio. Does it, the exercise in that range of motion, give you a ton of perceived tension in that muscle? Does it give you a burn at higher reps in that muscle? Does it give you a pump in that muscle after a few sets? Does it give you soreness and disruption in that muscle and weakness in that muscle after a few sets and maybe a day later? Then on the other hand, does it hurt the joints and connective tissues? And does it just completely exhaust your whole body or is it pretty kind to them? Stimulus on that top side, fatigue on the bottom side, divide the two into each other and you get the stimulus to fatigue ratios. The more you can get a big hit with tension, burn, pump, soreness, et cetera, and the less joint and connective tissue disruption you can impose and less systemic fatigue you can impose, the better. So if you pick a standardized range of motion and you do it and it's got a really good stimulus to fatigue ratio, maybe you try going a little deeper and it has an even better stimulus to fatigue ratio. For example, if you bench press with a regular barbell and it by definition stops at your chest, you may at some point have access to either dumbbells or even better, a cambered bar that has a big sort of open middle space and you can get to below your chest to, for a really nasty stretch. You will often notice that the stimulus to fatigue ratio for deep dumbbell presses 
And for sure, cambered bar presses is better in many cases, not all, than barbell presses just with a straight bar. And someone could say, well, what about active ROM? Well, what about my pecs for two sets of this shit get blown into the fucking moon and my joints feel amazing? Active, passive, fuck you, ROM, I don't give a shit. It fucking works. We know it works. And it's, it, empirical experience beats theoretical supposition every fucking day of the week. You can tell me the shit doesn't work. How the fuck do I get massive soreness and a crazy pump? That shit is not by accident. Clearly something's going on in my muscles, right? So you start out with a certain standardized range of motion. My ankle was itchy. And you play around with a bit more ROM and a bit less ROM. You see which one produces the best stimulus to fatigue ratio for you. It'll take you a while to figure that out. And then you do the thing that makes the best SFR. Sometimes that means if you roll, you'll stop here because you go, yeah, when I go back here and just nothing happens. Sometimes it means you roll away and you'll feel all that shit in the back, do all the really good stuff, get sore, get pumped, tension, burn. And you're like, oh man, I'm glad I'm doing this whole super full range of motion thing. And don't forget, tension under stretch is important. And that does not come through on EMG studies. So if you're saying, oh, but muscle activation was shown to be lower than this and that, that's only part of the picture and it's a very shitty, very small part. If you guys really want to read some fun articles about the limits of EMG, Google EMG Andrew Vygotsky, spelled phonetically V-I-G-O-T-S, whatever, ski, motherfucker, I don't know how to spell that shit. He knows how to spell his name and that's what's important and Google knows even better. So EMG is very, very limited. It is a tool, but it's a very, very limited tool. And so don't just Google EMG studies and be like, oh, clearly this is the only thing and active ROM's a thing. That's not quite the case, especially considering stretch under load is super powerful mediator of hypertrophy and it doesn't show up much on EMG. So it looks like there's almost no muscle activity, but it turns out that's where the most of the growth happens or at least a lot of it. Next thing is many exercises, something to remember, target multiple muscles and higher range of motion usually does that most of the time. When people say, oh, well, like if, if you do lateral raises and you stop here, it's all delts. It's not mostly delts. But if you go up here, it's no delts in all traps. It's not. It's a lot of traps, but still a bunch of delts. My question to that always is like, motherfucker, is some something wrong with your traps? Are they too big for you? Or do you want to belabor having to do extra shrug training in addition to your laterals? If you do super forearm laterals, look, stopping here is nothing wrong with. But if you do super forearm laterals and go all the way, assuming your shoulders can take it, which most of the time they can if you're using good technique, you're going to get an amazing, just as good, if not better, side delt stimulus, but you also get a free trap stimulus. I should put that in an unmarked van, white van with no windows, free trap stimulus. Kids come in and, well, you guys know how that, they never leave. The only place to go is the side of a milk carton. That's where kidnapped children go, I believe. In any case, last thing I'll say, do not, at least casually, replace your perceived stimulus to fatigue ratio in an exercise with a first pass biomechanical analysis, which is the only kind you'll get following people on TikTok and Instagram when they call themselves biomechanists but have no degrees in the field. Eye lasers. If some kind of range of motion really fucks up your triceps, tension, soreness, burn, the whole thing, but someone comes up and they're like, uh, technically that's not any active problem with triceps. You just flex shit at them and they'll fuck off. But on a serious note, if something really fucks you up, it's great for your joints and it really hits the muscle. Active, passive, as you've noticed from this talk, there's a ton of nuance there. There's no guarantees. And because hypertrophy can be active or passive in a stretch media form, if it really hits you fucking hard and it keeps your joints feeling good and the rest of you feeling great, somebody tells you you're going too deep because of some kind of passive active ROM bullshit, just be like, hey, listen, that's nice, but I'll need some more compelling evidence to tell me that what seems to be working best for me in the gym is actually not good for reasons that even most biomechanists disagree with. In any case, I got pretty feisty. Like, subscribe, join our member section if you want real nerd shit, and uh, just be a good person. Just go out there and do good for this world. Jesus, plant a tree or something. Get off YouTube for a bit. Yeah, but then come back on and watch our videos. See you guys next time.